This is Thursday, August 14, 2014. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morris Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today Joe Bonaveri. Welcome, Joe. Thank you, ma'am. May I ask when you were born? I was born October 1st, 1920 in the north end of Boston. And where do you currently live? I live in Goodyear, Arizona. I live there most of the winter, most of the winter, all of the winter. And um, I come east uh, sometimes the early part of June and I go back just after the 1st of October. Your marital status? I'm a widower. Pauline, my wife, passed away in 1996. Do you have children? No children. Tell us a bit about life in the North End when you were growing up. Well, life in the North End was, uh, it was quiet, of course, laid back. I can recall going to school, and I was 1925 when I went into the first grade. Couldn't speak a word of English. And it must have been exciting learning the English language. I don't remember it, but it, I'm sure it was exciting learning the English language one word at a time. And finally, I, I got to learn it pretty well, I guess. <laughs> what did your father do for a living? My father was a cement finisher and a laborer. And your mother? She was a candy dipper for a short period of time. And do you have brothers and sisters? I've got two brothers and two sisters. Uh, two sisters are gone. Mm -hmm. They both died at an early age of 40. And my brother, Louis, passed away in 2011. Louis was 88. And my younger brother, Anthony, um, he lives in Lunenburg. Anthony now is 88. Mm -hmm. And the three of us were in World War II. I went to Korea. Tony went to Korea. And Tony went to Vietnam. He stayed in the service and retired as an Army colonel. OK, Joe, tell us a little bit about um, growing up during the Depression. Well, growing up during the Depression, <clears throat> I went to work um, three months before my 15th birthday. I was fortunate enough to get a full-time job. And thousands, hundreds of thousands of young kids throughout the country did the same thing. I worked for a company in Brookline, Massachusetts called Eight Saxon Sons. I worked in a Crown Silver company that they owned. I was making five bucks a week. And uh, I never knew anybody to go hungry. There were no food stamps, no Section 8 housing, no welfare, but there was people. And people helping people, it was, it was so far different than what we have today. Today, everybody is looking for somebody to help them. It was just the other way around during the 1930s. If you could help yourself, you was always looking to find somebody that you could help. If people were fortunate enough to have a job and to have young kids, there's always somebody there to take care of their kids. I never saw anybody go hungry, never. Because where I lived in, in Dorchester, if we knew of a family that didn't have anything to eat that night, somebody in the neighborhood would add a little water to the soup or something, but everybody had something to eat. It, 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 was, it was just wonderful, people helping people. It, uh, uh, okay, Joe, you said you had a full-time job at 14. Were you also going to school? Oh yeah, I, I finished the first year of high school then, of course, I went to work for Eight Saxon Sons. 
And I went to night school, Monday, Tuesdays, and Thursdays. And there was no excuse coming home and say, Ma, I'm tired tonight, I can't go to school. <laughs> that didn't get you anywhere. You went to school, and if you said you were tired before you left, when you came back, you had to show that you really were there. That didn't cut any ice, you went. And um, I, I think, uh, and I'm not alone, that was, as I say, throughout the entire country, it happened in, all over the country. We had 30, 33% unemployment, if you can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. At, in night school, uh, were you being taught the same courses as you would have had during the day? Yes. You, you taught, uh, I'm sure there were, there must have been, we learned English, math, and uh, the three R's, writing, reading, arithmetic. And it was, I, I think we, I think it was two, three hours, I think seven to, you know, it was, must have been early, about six to nine, something like that. Now, while you were working in Brookline and while you were attending night school, were you ever made aware of events happening in Europe and Asia at that time? Well, I don't remember. Well, of course, I remember Prohibition. <laughs> My family made wine every year during the pro uh, Prohibition, and nobody bothered us. And uh, I don't know what a, I don't know whether I'm happy to have met these people or not, but I knew some of the mafia boys, if you want to call them that. And um, in the north end of Boston, which was the safest place in the city to live, you never heard of any robberies a woman being molested or nothing. It isn't like it is today, I mean. And of course, in the North End, back in those days, they had the fiestas that are going on right now. Every weekend, you'd have a different patron saint. As a matter of fact, uh, I had to postpone my wedding when I got married because patron saint holiday was the same weekend that I was going to get married, so we postponed the wedding for a week. <laughs> Don't mess around with the patron saint. Yeah, that was more important. All right. So, Joe, do you remember the attack on Pearl Harbor? Yes, I can remember. I, I know exactly where I was. I was at my friend's house, the Dorsey's, and we would listen to a Father Copland, who was a Catholic priest, and he would preach every Sunday. And I can remember they interrupted the program and told us about Pearl Harbor. Did you know where Pearl Harbor was? No, but I didn't know where Pearl Harbor was, mm -hmm. no. I doubt if too many people in the country knew where Pearl Harbor was. Mm -hmm. So, Joe, uh, now you're about 20, 21. What were you doing at the time war broke out? I was working. I was working for my godfather as a construction laborer. And uh, it was a Sunday, and that, that evening I went over to his house. He didn't live too far from me. He had a huge 20-room house in Dorchester there, less than five minutes walk from where we lived. And I went in. And he looked up at me, and I could see him now. He says, I've been expecting you, he says. Yeah, I says, I, I'm gonna, gonna join the Navy. Well, he says, come in, sit down. And my godmother, she couldn't speak English, so she made us some espresso coffee, and we sat there and talked for a few minutes. And I went back home and the next morning, I left for Washington, D.C. I went, because uh, I grew up and went to school 
with some boys from Washington. They went to school. And um, I stayed there for a couple of months, put, sowing my wild oats, so to speak. And while I was there, I worked for a company named the Capital Transit. And after a couple of months, we, I went down to G Street, and I can remember myself now walking in. There was a chief boatswain's mate there. And I said, I'd like to buy a round trip ticket to Tokyo. He says, the ticket's free, he said, but you came to the right place. <laughs> there was hundreds, thousands. Mm -hmm. it, it's hard to describe this country in, in that era. Okay. What made you choose the Navy, Joe? I don't know. I think I had a friend, George Nelson, that was in the Navy. He was stationed in Washington, and that may have been some influence. Mm -hmm. But I never regretted the Navy. Okay. Now, um, get back to what was Washington like? I mean, was this the first time you'd been away from Massachusetts? No, I, first time I went to Washington was 1936. It was a sleepy little town. And it was still beginning to grow there when I went in 1942. You could, <laughs> if you can believe this, I stayed with my friends in Southeast Washington. And I can remember being out on the balcony of their apartment, could hear a church bell ringing as you would in a small town. It was a wonderful place. Laid back, quiet. But then it began to grow. They had just completed the Pentagon at that time. Today, I wouldn't know how to cross the street. Now, Joe, you, uh, just, to be, um, just to make sure, you enlisted in the Navy. Yes. Okay. So, where would you send for basic? I went to Bainbridge. It was a, a camp that was just being developed in Maryland, Bainbridge, Maryland. And tell us what basic was like. There was nothing there. It was just a great big open field. I can remember they gave us a uh, mattress cover, and then they started to fill it with uniforms and all other kind of shoes and stuff. And I can remember throwing that over my shoulder with a bunch of the other fellas walking through a muddy field to go to the barracks because it was just being built. And we stayed there for, I think, two, three months. And then I was shipped to Norfolk, Virginia and went aboard the USS Chicopee and that was my home for the next three years. And what were your uh, duties, or were you trained for duties? Uh, what? Well, I was a, just an ordinary seaman to okay. begin with, then I, um, I became a gunner's mate. And what kind of duties does a gunner's mate perform? Well, you take care of the uh, guns on board ship. You clean them, maintain them, make sure they're ready at all times. You operate them when, when necessary. And do you remember what year, uh, what time of the year it was when you joined the Chicopee? I joined the Chicopee. <coughs> Uh, let me put it this way. Was it still 1942, or are we now in... It was 42 when it I was joined the Chicopee. Okay. And what kind of vessel was the Chicopee? She was an, uh, an oil tanker. She was um, 550 feet long, and she, we went along with the fleet, refueled the fleet. 
It's like taking your own gas station along with you when you went. Mm -hmm. And what was your ra rating at the time? I was just not an every seaman when Still I seaman. went aboard. About a year later, I was a gunner's mate. All right, you have now boarded the Chicopee as an ordinary seaman. Tell us what happened next. Well, we did a lot of traveling. I remember the first trip we took was down, uh, down to Texas up the Sabine River. That's where uh, we'd pick up our fuel. We'd carry uh, forward of the bridge about five million gallons of uh, high test aviation gas. And after the bridge would be a uh, number two bulk oil for the ships. Of course, the gas was for the planes. Our first trip was to Casablanca. Then the next trip we went to Orno, which is North Africa, and Bazerti. Bazerti is at the, the top of Africa. Mm -hmm. We made those trips two or three times. We went to Murmansk, that's in Russia. Let's talk about, about North Africa first. What was that like? North Africa, it wasn't, Oran is not a big bustling town. Very few people there. You gotta remember, this is 1942. Mm -hmm population in any of these countries wasn't as big as it is today. In North Africa, I recall one afternoon or whatever it was, Chung and I used to go on Liberty together. In downtown Oran, we stopped. <clears throat> there was a group of soldiers marching down the street, and they happened to be prisoners. They were of Rommel's African Corps, and they were being taken someplace, and they came to a um, cross street, and there was a convoy of trucks going by, and the guy, of course, they stopped them. After the trucks went by, the sergeant says, Raus, which means, let's go in German. <laughs> Nobody wanted to move. They kept prodding them, but these, these young fellas, fine looking men as I recall, nobody wanted to move. Sergeant, sergeant got kind of teed off. He shouted loud and clear, Rouse, nobody moved. <laughs> <coughs> Took out his 45 and he hit a man right in the shoulder. <laughs> he spun the man around, knocked him down, didn't kill him, hurt him, I'm sure. The other fellows just quick stepped. <laughs> they moved all right. You mentioned a gentleman named Chung. Chung and I, from the first day I went aboard ship, Chung had come from the West Coast. His father was a very wealthy landowner. And Chung, I'm sure, had the brains. I know he had the brains to become an officer if he wanted, but he was my fire controlman. And we became good, very, very good friends. We went liberty together. We were always together. And after the war, we were discharged in uh, San Francisco. Chung went home. I sent that man Letters, postcards, didn't have a telephone number for him. <laughs> <coughs> Never heard from Chung again, ever. Always wondered why. And I would imagine Chung just wanted to forget everything, like a lot of people. that Just went home, wanted to forget the war and everything connected with it. My brother Louis was one of those fellows came home and I never heard Louis speak about the war or nothing. Mm -hmm. oh, in later life, in the um, past few years of his life, uh, he would tell me about things. He was there, he landed on D-Day. 
Uh, my ship happened to be in the channel that day, but we didn't go ashore. Okay. We'll get to that in a minute. Let's get you back on the Chesapeake. Uh, you've done North Africa. Now you said you were uh, heading to Murmansk in Russia. We went to Murmansk for one trip. Mm -hmm. And um, the convoys, you know, these convoys were huge. Some of them would have as many as five, six hundred ships spread across the entire ocean, far out as of as you can see, you have ships. Of course, there'd always be destroyers on the outer rim mm -hmm. and in the middle protecting you as best they could from the submarines. You'd always lose quite a few ships. Going to Murmansk, we must have lost, as they told me, half the convoy. Uh, they were sinking ships faster than we could build them. At one time, that is. But we. I forget when we went, I think it was early 43, we went through the canal, went through Pearl Harbor. They had cleaned up most of the devastation. Of course, the Arizona at that time still leaking a lot of fuel. You could see the black water around it, that, which was the black oil coming out. I've been there a couple of times since, and. Still little bubbles of oil come up. And from there, we went out to uh, left Paul Harbor, went to Anahuitoc, which was a staging area for the 5th and 7th Fleet. And that was our base of operation. When we'd leave there, we'd go someplace, uh, and we'd come back, refit, and go off again. What was the name of the base of operation again? Anahuitoc. And, and where is that exactly? That's in the South Pacific now. If you remember, that's where they, um, um, after the war, they took all these um, old ships and captured ships and they brought them out there and dropped the atomic bomb, mm -hmm. remember? Yes. And they did it, the Athol is not there anymore. Oh, okay. So tell us a little bit about your trip to Murmansk. Uh, what was the city itself like? I, you never went into the city. Uh, oh. We didn't have okay. any more. We got to, I can remember uh, on the docks there, there were Russian sailors and they had these great big army boots and they had these sticks of butter. Years ago you'd buy butter, it was probably Three, three inches diameter, maybe around eight inches long. And I guess I, they didn't know what butter was, I'm sure, but they were taking these sticks of butter and I can see them now, rubbing it on their, their shoes, <laughs> trying to waterproof them, I guess. But Murmansk was a, it was a big, big seaport. Only one trip we made, that was enough. Weather was lousy. Uh, can recall going up the straits, uh, wind was blowing, water would freeze in the air, so to speak. All our cables and booms were covered with ice, deck was covered with ice, the rails were all icy. Yeah. yeah. So um, when you were on, on one of these voyages, what was your typical day like? Well, my typical day was um, um, cleaning the guns. We'd take them apart, clean them, put them back together, test fire them, and that was the day, just taking care of the, of the armament. Others, uh, engineers, would be down in, in the engine room uh, making sure the engines were working properly. Uh, we had a we could make our own fresh water, so uh, the tubes were always being cleaned. Everybody had a job to do. And the ordinary seamen, of course, are always chipping the deck, chipping the rest off of it, painting over the, after they cleaned it, they wire brushed it and put the yellow paint on it, chromium. 
It was always something to do. It kept you busy. Nobody would just hang around doing nothing. Did you ever have any downtime? Oh yeah, you had plenty of downtime. I mean, nobody cracked a whip over you. Um, when you were working, uh, um, we were enjoying the work we were doing, of course. Um, you'd stand watch, pour on and pour off. That went along. You, during the day, of course, you'd have a four hours on and four hours off. That was all day long, 24 hours a day. So it was, a, it was always something to do. And then, of course, two, three times a week, Ships would come alongside and want to be refueled and they'd come alongside and as a gunner's mate, Chung and I, we'd uh, have a sawed off shotgun and there was a spindle, it was about maybe 10 inches long, probably a little less than a quarter, half an inch in diameter with an eye at one end and we'd attach a uh, a small line on the end of it, put it in the barrel and we'd shoot it over to the ship that was coming alongside to get fuel. And they would take the small line and then they'd pull a little bigger one over and a little bigger one, then they'd finally bring a cable across, hold the ships from, so that we could uh, refuel them. Oh, we had all kinds of ships. I have a list of ships at home that came alongside battle wagons, destroyers, mm -hmm. cruisers, aircraft carriers. Pretty impressive, and they all needed gas. They all needed uh, fuel, and the aircraft carriers would, uh, we'd pump uh, high-test gas over to them for their planes. And I don't know when it was, but alongside came a Admiral Hosley ship and I was down the deck doing something. I looked up and there he was, wow. sitting looking over the side. <laughs> I, could, I could see right out of the hall up to him and said, Admiral. I said, where are we going this trip? He looked over the side and think he's saying, he said, we're going to Tokyo, sailor. <laughs> <laughs> I never forget that as long as I live. But it was, um, you know, it, it was not always Fight, fight, fight. We had a lot of good times. We'd have, um, they'd put on plays on the ship. The officers would dress up as women, put wigs on them. I've got pictures of that. You did what you had to do when you had to do it. Uh, it was times when you wish you were someplace else, but you mm -hmm. took that all in stride. You were mentioning uh, fight, fight, fight. Was the Czech Chess, uh, excuse me, the Chicopee ever uh, ever take part in the battle? Oh yeah, we went up to um, Iwo Jima, Okinawa. That was a pretty bad experience. Mm -hmm. Okinawa, I guess, was the worst experience we ever had because the kamikazes would come in hundreds, and of course, the Air Force would just like a shooting gallery and um, destroyers. And, all other ships would be fired at them, would knock them down. But they, it came every day, mm -hmm. every day. We lost quite a few ships there. They, they only had one, one purpose for being there, was to try and crash into a ship. And they did that every day. That was pretty bad. Yes, we, we would go along with the fleet. We had to be there. Uh, we weren't firing our guns, although we had quite a few of them. We defended ourselves uh, two or three times. But um, our purpose was there to uh, make sure the, the fleet had oil, gasoline. Mm -hmm. Of course, you defended yourself when you had to. Had a lot of submarine scares. We were the prime targets of submarines. We lost a few tankers. But you, 
I don't ever remember being scared. Well, maybe just once off the coast of Luzon when we got into that typhoon. Never saw anything like that in my life before or since. Can't imagine what it was like to inside of a typhoon. I understand we lost quite a few ships. I know that we had quite a few narrow misses from other ships who were blown off course and couldn't maintain their heading. My ship was 550 feet long and in the middle is where the bridge was. The bridge is just a great big rectangular box, you might say. And I happened to be on the bridge and that ship came up over a wave and she came down the other side and the bow hit the, hit the water and just kept right on the going. <laughs> I say to this day, if it hadn't been for that great big wall that hit the water, that ship would have just kept going right under the waves. You can't imagine. I, if, if you say, was you ever scared? I would say that would be the only time that I was scared. <laughs> it, was, it was brutal. And when did this take place, Joe? I think that was in 43, late, late 43, I guess it was. And uh, when, it's funny that when you got into the eye of the storm, we thought, us young fellows, we thought it was all over. The water was as, as calm as a mill pond. Sun was shining, and so we young fellows would say, oh boy, glad that's over. And of course, the old timers, they were old. They were 35, 40 years old. And the old timers would say, well, we've got to go through the other side yet. Oh, brother. <laughs> and that's going to be worse than coming into it. And uh, I guess it was. I don't remember, but I, it was just, mm -hmm. you couldn't hear anybody talk. You'd have to go up and put your mouth up to the guy's ear and holler at it so he could hear you. The wind would blow through those portholes. But it was, it, was, it was an experience, we got over it. You earlier mentioned some of the recreational activities on board ship. Did you have a chance to keep track of what was going on elsewhere in the war? I have a blue jacket manual that I kept a diary and you're not supposed to. If I had that diary, if that blue jacket manual, I could tell you when I left port, where we went, and when we came back. It's illegal to have done that, but <laughs> I didn't tell anybody. I also have a book at home that tells you every ship that came alongside to get refueled. I got pages on battle wagons of British ships, British destroyers, uh, British uh, aircraft carriers, uh, all kinds of cargo ships, destroyers, battle wagons, cruisers, other tankers. And of course, we never left the uh, Pacific, except uh, I don't know, it must have been early May or April, we left the Pacific, came through the Panama Canal. You never knew where the hell you were going. Captain didn't say, well, we're going to Hocus Pocus Dominocus. But eventually, scuttlebutt, you'd find out where you were going. Sometimes you'd find out where you'd been. That's when we was, yeah, it was sometime April or early May that we went back through the canal up into the English Channel. We knew we were in the channel. We found that out. But why, what we was doing there, 
nobody knew why we was there. Of course, we were refueling ships every other day. Um, it wasn't like uh, out in the Pacific or the Atlantic, we weren't moving. We were probably more or less stationary and ships, it was very easy to refuel them. Nobody knew what we were there. Nobody knew why we were there. I don't think anybody else in the fleet knew why we were there. Uh, I doubt very much even as some of the senior officers didn't know what was going on. D-Day uh, was a very, was the best Cape secret of the war. Yeah, it can, I had the 12 to 4 watch that night. I could look up and, and see those thousands and thousands and thousands of planes coming over. And of course, I found out later on that they were 101st in those planes. The 8th Air Force was taking the paratroopers behind the enemy lines. And sometime just before daybreak, uh, ships started to fire at the shore and more planes coming over. And then they ceased fire. Nobody ceased fire, but then the, all the landing crafts started, the LST started ashore, landing crafts went ashore. It was a hell of a day. I understand that you landed at Normandy the day after. Yeah, I, I, I tried to, I don't know what the captain, why he went ashore, but as a gunner's mate, we'd always, one or two gunner's mates would always go with the captain uh, as protection, I guess. And even before you got to the shore, we had a long boat. It took us a little while to get to shore. You see bodies, but you see body parts, and the beach was just littered with bodies. There were so many of them. Grave registrations couldn't, they couldn't clear them up overnight. And uh, men and equipment was coming ashore. At that time, they had the uh, the floating piers in place, and ships were coming alongside, unloading. You cannot imagine what was coming on that beach. There was anything anybody needed that wasn't coming ashore. You need the pencil, you find a pencil, regardless of what it is you needed, you could find it. It was, and it. As I understand, it kept coming for days after that. They even had, I found out later, they even had a um, pipeline, two or three or a half a dozen, come across the channel pumping fuel oil, gasoline for the trucks. What a well-planned invasion that was. Joe, which beach did you land on? Omaha. Omaha. Well, I didn't land on it. I went ashore on uh, Omaha. You went ashore. But, yeah, my, um, bro my brother landed on mm -hmm. Omaha. And he, he was with uh, some uh, uh, communications outfit. Mm -hmm. And was he Army? The Army, yes. Eighth Army. And Tony, Tony didn't get in the war. He got in the war late 44, early 45, because he hadn't been 17 yet. And he got in at the tail end of the war in Europe. Now, Joe, how long were you at Normandy? Oh, a couple of months, maybe. We were just brought in just for that one purpose because ships there were using up fuel. They weren't using it as 
Uh, they weren't cruising up and down the channel. They were stations, but they were using up fuel, and they, uh, they'd have to make sure they didn't get uh, empty. They, when a ship got to a certain point in its fuel, they'd come alongside and get filled up. It's like today, you, some of us wait until our gas tank is empty before we pull in a gas station, but they never did. Their gas tank was half full or three quarters full. It was time to top off. Always had to top off just in case they had to run someplace and get there in a hurry. But even if they had to run, they'd always take you along with them. <laughs> so. All right, tell us what happened afterward. Well, we hung around there for, I don't know, another week or so. Then we left, went back through the Panama Canal and out into the Pacific. And uh, then we went up to Iwo Jima. That was the next. And from Iwo, we went up to uh, Okinawa. Let's talk about Iwo Jima for a moment. This is now February 1945. Yeah. Supposed to have been an operation, maybe a couple of days, a couple of weeks. Well, we, we knew we were in Iwo Jima because of Scuttlebutt eventually, but mm -hmm. uh, we weren't ever part of a battle. Mm -hmm. We never went up and started shooting at anybody. We would protect ourselves, but uh, that was about all. But uh, we know we were in Iwo Jima because Scuttlebutt on the ship. And uh, uh, sometimes we'd hear about how we were doing on the beach and stuff of this nature. But we were there and then uh, we went up, I think July, we went up to Okinawa. We knew we were in a battle there because every once in a while they'd pick us as a target. Not too often. Did you ever have a chance to go on shore at either of these islands? No, the only island we went on to was um, Anna we talk. Mm -hmm. uh, we'd come back and uh, you'd get shore leave for one day, not even a day, just so many hours, so many men uh, would go ashore and um, uh, they'd give us a couple of bottles of beer. I never drank beer in those days. And I remember a great big fellow named Hikes, his name was, I'd always give him his two bottles of beer. <laughs> And you'd go ashore, you'd stay on the island for two or three hours, and then you'd come back. But you never, you never had really shore leave. I mean, once you got in the Pacific, there was... Other than when we, after the war, we went up into Tokyo, and that's when we even got liberty run ashore. Mm -hmm. Okay, Joe, okay, you've now been at Iwo Jima, you've been around Okinawa. Do you remember when the atomic bomb was dropped? No, we, we never knew the atomic bomb was dropped. We How knew. about when the Japanese surrendered? Oh yeah, we were, we were up in Tokyo Bay when it surrendered. Mm -hmm. And oh, where yeah, was the Chicopee that. exactly? Big pardon? Where was the Chicopee uh, at Tokyo Bay? Well, the exact location, I don't know, but we, we were in Tokyo Bay. Mm -hmm. Chung and I went ashore two or three times when we were there. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, it's awful funny, the, um, the Japanese, after the war and the surrender, they seem to take things in stride. They try to get back to normal life as quickly as possible. I can remember we're in Tokyo and we could see the Emperor's Palace across the moat and Chung and I were trying to figure out how we could get over there to see how we could get there. And of course, see this young man coming down dressed up in a suit, carrying a briefcase, I see that guy now. 
And I went over to him when I started to talk with him. He didn't understand what I was saying. So Chung went over then. Finally, this guy looked at Chung, he says, I don't speak English. He says, turned around, walked away. Just as plain as I said it right now. Probably that was the only words he knew in English. And off he went. We never got to see the Empress Palace. But there, there was devastation even in Tokyo. I mean, there had to be. But we, we weren't ground troops. We never got into the cities after a battle. We never saw any of the devastation that I've seen in pictures and have pictures of. We never saw any of that. Maybe it's just as well. Now, Joe, during this period in the war, of course, of the European theater, Germany has surrendered. Were you told that we're going to be invading Japan? Oh, yeah, we knew we were going to Japan. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, we, there was a lot of talk about that from Mokinau and uh, the fleet was a lot of activity after Okinawa because the next step was to ch go to Japan. Uh, we would we'd be supplied. Our ship was always full of oil, always full of oil. It seemed like once a week we had an emergency marine come and like, didn't make any difference. We probably had plenty left, but they'd fill us up. And, uh, and ships were always coming alongside, always getting topped off. And, um, oh yeah, we knew we were going to Tokyo. And I remember when Roosevelt died, mm -hmm. nobody seemed to know who the vice president was. Who's the president? Nobody knew Harry Truman. But I've heard a lot of arguments about Harry dropping the bomb, but I've read a, quite a few articles about it. He, that, was the, that was the best thing he could have done for both sides. They estimated well over a million casualties if that hadn't happened. As a result, they killed two or three hundred thousand. But We won the war because this country turned itself into a, a manufacturing machine. You can't imagine when you went ashore, no matter where you went, you would see trucks, jeeps, ammunition, in, in town squares, you see trucks and tanks. It seemed like there was, didn't have enough room to put what, what we were manufacturing here. And it wasn't just the men, you know. We, we had a, the women would take and fly the B-17s across the North Atlantic, unarmed. So you got to give, and uh, it, it, was a, it was a different country. It, it, can you imagine what old man Sullivan must have felt when somebody came up to him and gave him that telegram that his five sons had been killed? Still went to work. And that, that was repeated thousands of times. It was, it was, uh, <laughs> Not having lived in those days, it's going to be hard to try and describe to you what it was like. It was just, people were different. Even politicians would, oh yes, we had a scoundrels, but not like we have today. People wore their patriotism on their arms. I don't see that today. I don't know why. 
I'm not saying that people don't care about the country, but we're too materialistic and and political correct. I don't know. Okay. Well, let's get back to you. Um, Japan has surrendered. You're still uh, stationed on board the the Chicopee. Tell us what happened. Uh, did you have enough points to go home? Oh yeah. Well, we um, the whole ship was sent back to Uncle Sugar. We got orders one day. I'm sure the captain got his orders, and and uh, we headed back to the states. And we were, and we had. I don't know how long that pennant was. A homeward bound pennant. It's a, it's a big. Uh, I always happen to be red. I have a piece of it. It's probably six inches wide, and this piece has got to be about a foot long. And I was trailed as many months as you would see. You were able to. I don't know how many feet of it you are allowed to. But going back to the States, our ship got rid of all kinds of armament. All the ammunition that we had above was thrown over the side. Anything that was of no value anymore was thrown over the side. And I've heard from other men in the fleet that were throwing airplanes over the side. Um, just getting rid of anything that was obsolete. But we came back. If I had my blue jackets painted, I could tell you the date and the time we went under the Golden Gate Bridge. Chung and I were discharged there in San Francisco. And then I got on a troop ship and came across the country. I was discharged in Bainbridge, Maryland, where I started. What did you do afterward? After the war, my shipmate, Eddie Lamb, who lived in Jamaica Plain, he wanted to become a police officer. So he talked me into going to police school with him, which I did do. And I became a police officer for about six months. I didn't care for the job. So I, I lasted six months, and I can remember they going back to the Station 16 and said to my captain, I said, I, <laughs> this job's not for me, Captain. So he said, I'll keep you on the roster for six months. And he said, after six months, he says, I'll take you off. He said, but you can come back any time after that. So I went back to work with my godfather. I went over to MIT and took some courses in estimating surveying stuff like that, reinforced concrete. And I eventually became a superintendent. And uh, 1955, 56, somewhere in there, I started my own little construction company. And I, I did that up until 1995. Where was this company located? In, um, in Cushing Avenue in Dorchester. And then it was in Natick here. Mm -hmm. yeah. I've done a lot of work in Natick. I, uh, I remodeled the second floor of this building years ago when it was a children's library upstairs. And I did the uh, I built the uh, fire station over on Speen Street. I did some work at the police station when it was across the street. And the civil defense uh, over in uh, where the fire department headquarters used to be over there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I did work on the, the Fisk Church on the corner there. But I, I uh, I never did any private work, so to speak. My work was for the cities and towns and a lot of government work. Mm -hmm. I've worked in the, the three Virgin Islands. Oh, I've been there eight, nine, ten times. 
I worked in Bermuda a couple of times. We have a, a Navy hospital there on the end of the island. And uh, I worked for the Bahamian government. We, <laughs> we built an incinerator to burn the dope they had. And uh, we have a Coast Guard station off a little island called La Pedusa off the coast of Sicily. We have a Coast Guard station there. And uh, we remodeled a uh, dental lab there one day. And I've worked literally from the Canadian border all the way to Key West Florida. Nothing big, nothing big. Half a million dollar job was a big job for Joe Bonverry. Of course, in those days, a half million dollar job was a really a big job. Mm -hmm. Today, it's just a little alteration. Now, Joe, did you remain with the Navy, join the Navy Reserves? Yes, I came back, I joined the CBs and um, went to uh, Korea mm -hmm. with the CBs. Stayed there for a year, and I came back. I joined the Naval Air Reserve down at Squanum. Squanum was, airfield is not there anymore. It hasn't been there for years. Uh, we used to fly the PBYs. Uh, PBYs were used for submarine patrol. Very effective, because mm -hmm. they're slow, 100 miles an hour, <laughs> top speed, 130. Okay. Let's go back to Korea for a moment. Uh, when were you there? 1951. And where were you stationed? Oh, I don't know. We were building uh, Quonset huts, roads. We'd build uh, airfields. Uh, we could build, we could build a, an emergency airfield in an hour. You'd have some planes up there that had fuel left for an hour and they couldn't get in the big, and uh, they'd tell us to go out. And we'd literally blow trees out of the way and, and uh, clear the land and nothing fancy, just enough so they'd come down. We'd put these uh, steel mats down there, interlock each other, and the planes would land. They'd be beat up, of course, when they landed. My tour of duty would last just about a year. And I came back, I joined the Naval Air Reserve. And how long were you with the reserves? Well, all told, I spent 10 years. I went in early 42, January 42, I think it was, and got out in the 52, so 10 years. I must have been in Squanum maybe about four years. And what were it you was, doing, oh, I'm sorry, what were you doing in Squantum again? Just well, the Naval Air Reserve, they had mm -hmm. PBYs down there, okay. and I was a waste gunner. Waste gunner, okay. And uh, you'd get paid, of course, and uh, we'd, uh, two weeks a year, why, You'd stay right there on the base, and they'd take you up, and just training for the next war to come down the pike. At the time you left uh, the Navy, what was your rate? Gunners made third class. And do you remember what kind of medals accommodations you received? Well, we had, um, we've got, we've got three medals, mm -hmm. Pacific, Atlantic, I forget what the other one's for. And we earned four battle stars, which meant we were in four major engagements. You were part of the, of the fleet that was in that engagement, so they recognized you. Uh, we never had to shoot anybody. A couple of times we defended ourselves against air attacks, but our job wasn't there to do any fighting. Mm -hmm. 
You know, there's, there was an incident there when we, they brought us, they brought us, I think it was five Japanese prisoners, I don't know where they came from, and uh, we kept them in our barber shop. Barber shop was uh, up forward and it had a cage around it, so we locked them in there. Then we had a, um, a Japanese flyer that we picked up out of the water, and we brought them aboard, put them in the officer's quarters, and of course, he had a 24-hour guard on him. He was beat up a little bit, but I couldn't take to this guy. The first time I went up to take my turn to watch, I couldn't take to him. I couldn't even speak with him. I, I was so mad, I was saying to myself, this guy wanted to kill me an hour ago, and here I, here I gotta be nice to him. But it's surprising, we Americans, we, we, we're built different. I don't know why we call ourselves some Americans. We come from all over the world. When I went back the next time, uh, I brought him milk, came in a little carton, and I don't know what the cake it was that they gave us for dessert, and I brought that up to him. Turned out this guy, young boy, I don't think he's any older than I was, 20, 22, 23, a graduate of Southern California. And he'd gone back to Japan to see his mother and father. And of course, they grabbed him, World War broke out and they grabbed him. And I can remember the day that we transferred the prisoners. They got them in the launch. I went along, I know Chung went along with me, and uh, Cox, and we took them over to AP. AP is a big transport. We pulled the launch side, and he stepped off, and, and there's a ladder going up, there's a platform there. And I was helping them, these guys off, and he was the last one off. He stepped on them, I can see him now. He looked out and he stuck out his hand. I tell you the truth, I didn't hesitate a minute. I grabbed that hand and I shook it. And then turned around and went up the ladder. This guy was doing for his country what I was doing for mine. He didn't hate me, and I sure as hell didn't hate him. And that's, must, that's the way it must have been all the way through mm -hmm. with everybody. Okay. <laughs> now, Joe, did you, after the war, did you join any veterans organizations? No, I never joined a veterans organization. Okay. Now, Joe, let's talk about the organization you founded a few years ago called SOS for World War II Vets. Yeah, my brother asked me to, to do that. And which brother was that? At Louis. Louis, okay. I was, I was here and I went over, I, I'd go over two or three times a, a week. Uh, Louis, towards the end of his life, with dementia, and I'd pick him up and uh, he liked uh, the dog race, and I'd take him down to dogs. He's doing that for 40 years. And he said, you know, he said, I know a lot of my buddies, he says, and a lot of them are having trouble. He said, do you think you could do something? Bother him. I said, what the hell do you want me to do? Well, he says, some of these guys want to go to Washington to see the World War II Memorial. And I'm a charter member of that memorial. I was there at groundbreaking ceremonies, and I was, I, I got tickets uh, to go to the uh, opening day. I brought a couple of vets with me. But I said, let me think about it. And the more I thought about it, I said, why not? So I have a woman in my neighborhood at home. I live in a gated community, one of those old folks home out there. And she used to work for Tom Hanks. She was a, a publicity agent for him. 
And I asked her, could she give me some pointers? So she did. So she helped me put all my pamphlets together. And, and so I started, little at a time. So we have done nothing big and spectacular. Um, we sent, um, a year ago, last December, <clears throat> we sent five Navy vets back to Pearl Harbor. They happened to be there. And um, they called me, one called the other. So we raised enough money, I think it was 12, 13,000. It wasn't, not too much from Sky Harbor to Honolulu. And um, last year, the 69th anniversary, we sent a fellow from Native Care to uh, Normandy. And uh, when Jim came back, I visited with him. I've known Jim for years. And Jim lives down the Cape. And shortly after he came back, uh, uh, he fell, never recovered. So we're happy to give him his last wish. And this past June, with the help of the people in Natick and surrounding towns and, and the Metro West, we raised enough money to send a couple of guys to Normandy. And so I, I know the honor flights. I met with the people up in Prescott, Arizona. They do a marvelous job. They work their butts off, raising money, bake sales and everything. And they send hundreds of guys to Washington every year. Uh, I, I know some people out in Columbus, Ohio to do the same thing. These people really work. And now we have an, uh, another on the flights up in Nashville, New Hampshire. And um, they do a good job. And we can't get a quarter from the United States government. Isn't that, I don't understand it. I've tried to, I've written up grants and sent them to Washington. I've sent them to the veterans organizations. I can't seem to find a politician that'll say, yeah, send it over here. But we give money to countries that hate us, kill our citizens, spit in our eye. We give them billions of dollars. I, I don't understand it. Joe, it, is there a contact information for those who might be interested? I, I've got a website. I've got two or three websites. Mm -hmm. um, SOS, www com, uh, SOSWW2.org. I have a PayPal account. And um, we have a tax free number. We have a federal ID number. Uh, we're a nonprofit 501 3C organization. Put a lot of time getting that. And uh, uh, it's gratifying to know what, that you can help somebody. And uh, yeah, it may sound crazy, but for two, maybe three weeks now, I got a call from a guy. He says, my name is so-and-so. He says, um, can you do something for me? He says, I said, what can I do for you? He says, can you get me a cane? I said, a cane? Yeah, I said, I want one of those new canes. He says, I said, why can't you get one? He said, I haven't got the money. I had to get the money. Didn't have $40 to buy himself a cane. I said, you, I said, give me your address. I said, I'll get one. So I went online and they cost $39.95, you know, those new ones. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, Gave me information, they sent him the cane. He called me, he thanked me for it. <laughs> it is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Now I have a fellow that needs a walk-in bathtub, really he does. He fell in his bathtub, lives right here in Natick. And he got 13 stitches over his, his right ear. And so he can't take a bath in himself. 
So he must give up his dignity to somebody to come in twice a week and give him a sponge back. What the hell kind of business is that? Now, I've done a lot of government work. Someday when you wanna sit down with me, I'll tell you a little bit about government waste. Just my little two and a half cent company, thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, and yet they waste every, every minute of every day, they waste more money than if they gave it to these organizations throughout this. Take a billion dollars, that's cup change today, and spread it around all these organizations that are trying to help the veterans. What you could do with, with one billion dollars, all these, look at this wounded warrior project. Why must this ordinary citizen collect money to help those guys. I know why, but why should they have to do it? That's the government's job. Mm -hmm. And you think these politicians, they don't care. I've talked to them. I've knocked on 435 doors in Washington, D.C. It took me a week. I had the letters like I did last year at the State House here. Didn't get a lousy dime, not one red cent. Mm -hmm. And these people, are trying to tell us how we should live. They want to go on a vacation. They go down to Andrews Air Force Base, get in the jet, and away they go. They're going on a fact-finding trip. Take their wife and kids with them. Oh, they have to pay for their meals, but the plane is going anyway, is it? So what difference does it make? It, it, something's wrong in this country. I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm but we're gonna lose it sure in hell unless, unless the people somehow or another grab hold of the reins and do something. It's a shame. Yeah. It's a shame. Uh, okay. you, well, Joe, um, we're gonna wrap this up. Is there anything else you'd like to uh, say? No, all I'd say to the people who are watching this, uh, this is your country now. We turned it over in pretty good shape. We did the best we could with our sons and daughters. Uh, we probably held back a little bit, and sure as hell, they held back a hell of a lot more on their sons and daughters. It's your country. If you lose what you got, you're never going to get it back. And that's for sure. There's a lot of things I can't do today that I used to be able to do growing up. And for God's sake, you see an old man or an old woman Go talk with them. They'll tell you stories you won't believe of a country that was just a joy to live in. Nobody told you what you could do and couldn't have to do. Today, you can't buy fireworks because you might hurt yourself. In my day, they said, you want to blow your fingers off? Go ahead, blow them off. You want to roller skate in the street without a helmet? Go ahead. You don't need a helmet to ride a bicycle today. I don't know. You want to drink water out of a garden hose? Go ahead. We did it. I did it. But don't lose what you got here. Don't lose what you got. My generation will soon be gone. And if you see one that's in need of something, regardless of what it is, like that old man needs a cane, $40, and he couldn't get it. Something's wrong. You've got to take this country back. You've got to do something. Mm -hmm. I'm going to stop because I could stay here all day and talk yeah. about it. Okay. And with that, Joe Bonaberry, thank you so much for You're taking welcome. part in the Native Veterans Oral History Project. You're welcome. Thank you. Mm -hmm.